Good morning, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So I'd like to welcome everyone here this today and those joining us on phones or YouTube or television or computers, whatever way you're able to join with us today. So praise the Lord that he's made a way that you can join with us and that we can gather as one heart, maybe not physically in the same room, in the same place, but in one heart as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. There's only one nation unto God. It's God's nation and it's his generation, a chosen generation. And he's called each one of us for such a time as this. Hallelujah. For what he's going to do in the end times. And we are certainly in the end times. And what God is going to do, people of old, people in the Old Testament would have just loved. The prophets of old that have spoken about the times we are now in, they would have just given everything, anything to be in the time that we are living in. That is how precious the time, the season we are in. I believe this is the last generation in the earth. And what God's going to do is a, a culmination of all that he has purposed from the beginning, from the beginning, from what's been written in the Bible and the Old Testament testified of what was and prophesied of what was going to come in the latter days because the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former house. And the former house, yes, there was a tabernacle in the times of Moses and the glory of the Lord was there. And yes, there was the New Testament church on the day of Acts and the glory filled the house. But what God's going to do right down in this time is going to be more glorious, which absolutely is amazing because we're going to look at some examples today of what uh, glories that were shown in the book, in the Bible. And yet what God is planning and purposing and performing in his church throughout the world for this hour, for this season, is going to be even more glorious than anything we're going to read about today. So hallelujah, we, are, we were born for such a time as this. And I'm excited because, you know, we could have been born in 1422 or 907 or 1683, you know, but we are in this generation and I'm preaching this and it's 2020. And hallelujah, hallelujah, our best days, our best years are still ahead in God. And if we will just keep that vision and keep our eyes focused on the Lord, he's going to bring it to pass and he's going to bring to pass his purpose in the earth, his vision. It's not about any man's vision. It's not about any organization's vision. It's about God's vision in his word. And he said, write the vision and make it plain that those that read the vision will run with it. So the vision has been written. It's in his Bible and it has not changed. God has not de deferred from his plan. He has not changed his mind and he knew each person was going to be born in this hour for this day for his purposes and glory to God. It's both his to will and to do and he's going to do it in us and through us because there's a whole world that needs to know about Jesus Christ and he's raising up people all over the world and each one listening to my voice. You have been raised up for such a time as this. Even like Esther was raised in her generation for a purpose for that time and her uncle Mordecai I said you know she was put in that position in that place for God's purposes not for her own purposes and so God is building his church it's a glorious church and now having said all that uh, I've called this topic today change from glory to glory hallelujah change from glory to glory that is exactly what God's doing in every heart hallelujah and it's for his glory and it's for his purposes hallelujah so let's just read start with uh, reading from the King James Bible John chapter 3 let's see how it all starts John chapter 3 and verse 3 Hallelujah. <clears throat> Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he wanted to know about the things of God. And Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the Amplified says, Jesus answered him, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you that unless a person is born again anew from above, he cannot ever see, know, be acquainted with and experience the kingdom of God. You know, and as believers, we understand that Jesus was not talking about being a born again naturally, right? Because we've already been born naturally. 
but what he was talking about was be, having a spiritual birth, being a born again spiritually. Hallelujah. Let's turn over to John 14, verse 6. We probably, many of us would know this scripture. And it says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. You cannot go through a priest. You cannot go through Mary. You cannot go through any idols or any other gods. Jesus said he is the only way to the Father. There's no other way. Hallelujah. And, you know, when we were convicted of sin or when we are convicted of sin and sincerely confessed and sought God's forgiveness then we repented of our sins. You know, we were convicted and we, we, we were remorseful of what we'd done or said. And so we, we repented. We turned away from our sin and the lifestyle of sin. And we put our faith and trust in God, knowing that Jesus died on the cross, taking every punishment of our sin that we deserved. We deserved to be punished, but Jesus bore our punishments. And then after three, he died, of course, he'd been crucified. And then after three days, he rose from the dead. No other God that people call God has ever risen from the dead. Jesus is the only living God. Hallelujah. And this change, this, conver this conversion, it took place in our heart. It's a heart thing. Hallelujah. And then we get changed on the outside. Amen. And this experience, of course, is being known as born again. However, being born again is just the beginning of God's plan for our lives. It's just the beginning. Some people think, oh, that's it. No, no, no. That's just the beginning of the great things God's got planned for each life. Then we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And it reads, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You know, as natural babies, when we were born, you know, what was the first thing we were given was milk. And as we had more milk, we grew. And it's the same spiritually. And there's a milk of the word, hallelujah, that God gives to new Christians. And he wants us to grow. The Amplified says, like newborn babies, you should crave a thirst for earnestly desire the pure unadulterated spiritual milk that by it you may be nurtured and grow unto completed salvation all right so we are saved but then we are growing in our salvation experience in our walk in God to complete spiritual salvation hallelujah hallelujah and so that natural milk sustained the growth of a natural baby and God's spiritual milk sustains the natural growth of spiritual babies, those that have been born again. Hallelujah. And have you ever heard the expression, like father, like son? Well, spiritually, we've been born into the father's kingdom. And so we are growing to become like him, like our heavenly father. Our Heavenly Father will be like our Heavenly Father with His full character and likeness. Amen. That's the plan. And it's a God plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So who saw the glory of God? You know, the children of Israel saw the glory of God. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 16, verse 10. You know, God's always wanted to dwell with His people. And we read here, Exodus 16, verse 10. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked towards the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. You know, here, so here's natural Israel and then the glory of God just shows up like as the pillar. He's the cloud. He's just there. I mean, how awesome is God that he can just manifest himself like that and natural Israel are our example because God wants to do exactly the same thing for us. And who else uh, saw the glory of God was Moses. 
and the children of Israel, they saw it on Moses' face. So let's turn to get some understanding here. Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. And verse one to six. Second Corinthians chapter three. Verse one to six. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know, people are reading you every day. People watch you. People listen to you. People see how you behave, where you go, what you do. And we are living epistles. We are living examples of God in our lives. Verse 3. For as much as you are manifest, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Do you remember Mo Moses was given the law and the Ten Commandments in stone and, and it was people could see it right there that the stones and God's finger wrote the Ten Commandments. But now God is writing his word in our heart so that in our heart, what motivates us is coming from what God's put in our heart. Hallelujah. That's why God needs to write his word in our heart. Verse four, and such trust have we through Christ to God word. Not, now that, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth and the spirit gives life. Under the law, it was don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But in God, by the spirit of God, we've been brought into a freedom of God, a free to make the right choices. And because we make the right choices, we no longer want to do that or do that or do that or do that. But it's out of choice not out of demand or constraint. It's out of choice because we want to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord. Hallelujah. And so God is writing his word on our hearts. Hallelujah. Let's read on verse seven. But if the ministration of death written and graven in stones was glorious because the, the word of God is glorious, how shall not, so just, sorry, I just, Read that again. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stone was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. You know, Moses was in the presence of God and the glory of God showed on, shined on his face. Verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. What God is doing, what God is doing in his church in each life, it's going to be more glorious than what the children of Israel saw, than what Moses took of, it's going to be more glorious. It's not just for one person. It's going to be for many people, God's church. Hallelujah. So this is also saying that under the law, there was a glory, a measure of glory under the law, but there's going to be a greater glory under God's grace. Hallelujah. Verse 12, 16. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall be turned, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. It says, there's another scripture, it says, blindness in part happened to the Jews 
It's spiritual blindness happened to the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. So the Jews were God's chosen people. They were in the ways of God and then unbelief and disobedience and all manner of things happened to them. And, you know, it says God actually divorced them and he's grafted in the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And that's why we shouldn't boast because they were God's original chosen. And now they're just put on, if I can say it, on hold. The Gentiles are coming in and then God is going to take the veil away from their heart and they're going to see. And I know today there are many Jews being born again. They call Messianic Jews. They have really received Jesus Christ as their Messiah. However, there are many Jews in the world today that are still waiting for the Messiah. They missed his first coming. They missed the encounter of Jesus Christ. He was their Messiah and many missed his visitation. And I tell you, in this day and age we're in, he's coming again. And we don't want to miss his day of visitation. He's coming again. And first of all, he's coming in his people. He's going to be revealed in his people on that day of atonement. And we want to be part of that people, that God fullness is going to be in us. And also he's coming a second time. And so every day we need to be in God, focusing on God, pressing towards God, living for God and and we are in this generation. So it's very exciting. It's very exciting. And, you know, but just looking back, before we were born again, we were just like those Jewish people. We were spiritually blind to the things of God and to, to, spiritually blind to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we had, as it were, a spiritual veil on our heart towards God and towards the kingdom of God. And But when we repented, we began to see clearly the things of God. Hallelujah. And our spiritual eyes, our spiritual heart was enlightened. It's like the lights went on. I see God. I see God. And for those of you who've been born again, it's like we were in darkness, just in darkness. But then when we got saved, the lights came on. It was a whole new world because he's in us and he's alive and he's real and he's, he's alive in us. And he just wants to have his way in every person's life and and fulfill his plan for every life. And there's an abundance of life in Jesus Christ that the world cannot offer. The world cannot satisfy the heart of man. Only Jesus Christ and the things of God will satisfy the heart of man. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, Solomon, he saw the glory of God and he made a house for the Lord. Let's turn to Second Chronicles chapter 5. Second Chronicles chapter 5. And we read here in verse 1. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. And then verse down in verses 11. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. They were all ready to go, all ready. And I'm just going to say here, this is an example of what God wants to do in our time. And we as believers are called priests. Every believer is a priest. Hallelujah. Your chosen generation, a royal priesthood and royal is kingly. So we are king priests unto God. Verse 12, and the Levites, which were the singers, all of them as Aphas of Heman and Jeduthun, with the sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen, and white linen's the righteousness of the saints, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar. East always speaks of the presence of God. And with them, 120 priests sounding with trumpets. 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Trumpets speak of the word of God. Verse 13, it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister 
by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. When did the glory of the Lord fill the house? When the priests blowing the trumpets, the word of God were of one accord, one sound, all blowing the same, the same word. That's what God's going to do in these end times. At the moment, there's a little bit of mixture around, around about the doctrines, but God's true ministries, God is raising them up and they're going to blow with a clear sound and it's going to bring a unity in the body of the Christ because there is only one body and one faith. One body. We may be in different nations in different countries, but God is bringing about a unity. And that unity is done through his word, by his ministries. And there, we can see there's going to be a worship that's going to have a one sound. And many people, of course, we love to worship the Lord. And he's going to do it through his word as well. A oneness in his word. And it's going to be for his glory. And when that oneness comes about, what happens? The glory of the Lord fills the house. You know, and collectively and individually, we are the house of God, the temple of God. And when we have a heart for God and we allow him to do all that he wants to do in our heart, and that's little by little, day by day, month by month, he's doing it in us. And when we are fully um, surrendered and yielded and each member of the body is doing exactly the same thing, we are all yielded and surrendered to God, to his word, to his ministries, God's going to fill his house, his house with the fullness of himself. I tell you, it's going to be worth it. And we need to just keep our eyes on that vision because that's what God's going to do. Hallelujah. 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 And we know, um, well, let's just talk about the word glory. You know, what is glory? just so we have that really clear. And I've got a definition here. It's been expressed by many different words because it is hard to express glory. But the best I can come at it is, it's, and the Bible gives these examples as majesty. Glory has a majesty about it. It has a splendor. It has dignity. It's glorious. It's honor, has honor. There's a magnificence about it and light, light. And let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Hallelujah. Just love you, Lord. Hallelujah. John chapter 1. Verses 1 to 5, and it says here, In the beginning was the Word, and we know God is three, is God the Father, God the, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit. So in the beginning was the Word, as in God the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. So where does life come from? Being in him in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not the, that verse 5 in the amplified says and the light shines on in the darkness for the darkness has never overpowered it put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it and is unreceptive to it so light and darkness can't be in the same space we're either in darkness or we're in light. We're either in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. God wants everyone in the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. And when we were born again, hallelujah, what happened? We became illuminated, enlightened. We saw the light in our spirit. And God delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. Amen. And verse 14, it says, And the word was made flesh. So this is Jesus. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us as Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's not just all about grace, grace, which is God's mercy, which is wonderful and his wonderful benefits, which is his grace, but truth. And the word of God is the truth. So it's a balance in God. 
We can't just be all grace, 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 grace. And we can't be just all truth, 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 you know, the word, the word, only the... It's a balance. It's a balanced gospel. <laughs> and Jesus was full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so Jesus displayed the glory, the honor and majesty of his Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. And who else saw the glory of God? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And just reading verses 1 and 2. And after six days, I tell you, we are in the sixth day, the 6,000th year of the Lord. A day of the Lord was just a thousand years. And so we are in that redemptive week of God and we're up to this end, nearly towards the end of the 6,000th year. And what does it say here? And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain apart. There are times when we just need to draw apart to God. You know, we are together, of course, collectively, but there are times when we just need to just come aside and just be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Just sometimes just put, we're going to have to put other things aside, put other things aside. Uh, further down the list of things to do or the busyness of life or the distractions of life and come aside. And they went up to a high mountain and your know, high mountain speaks of prayer, the mountain of God. Let's go into the mountain of the Lord. It speaks of our prayer life and we have to come aside to have our prayer life. God doesn't want to share us. He loves us, but he wants that quality time with us, not always when we're doing something and including him as well. He really enjoys his children giving their quality time to him. Hallelujah. And verse 2. And so this is Jesus was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as light. Shine as the sun. I just thought then that must have been what um, in, a, in a sample, in a measure, what Moses must have, his face shone. Right, It didn't say as the sun, but that was I'm sure that was what was implied. His face was brilliant in his measure under the law. But here's Jesus, God in flesh, his face shining as the sun and his raiment was white as light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. And that word transfigured, he was transfigured before them. So a change went place. I mean, there he was in his natural self, but then he was transfigured before them. And that word transfigured means a metamorphosis. And it means to change or transform. For example, you know, a caterpillar changes into a beautiful butterfly. And as believers, we're being changed. And through God, we're going to metamorphosize from a mere natural man, a natural person into the likeness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Amplified says, and six days after this, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And his appearance underwent a change in their presence. And his face shone clear and bright like sun and his clothing became as white as light hmm. but they kept their eyes on Jesus and as we keep our eyes on Jesus we're going to see his glory hallelujah they went with Jesus they were with Jesus they were in the mountain and he was transfigured hallelujah hallelujah so we just need to keep our eyes on him. And actually, who is Jesus? He's God, the word. We need to keep our eyes on the word. Hallelujah. 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 The word of God is quick and powerful and it's alive. And there's a lot of, uh, if I can say it this way, there's a lot of preaching going on. And, and sure, it's preaching and it's quickening and so forth. But, you know, people gave their very lives, tortured Um, tortured and killed just 
so we can have the word of God. They paid with their life so that we can actually read the word of God. Believe the word of God. Let it be written in our hearts. And so we need to make time for the word of God. And we need to be around the word of God. And you'll know from, you know, from this ministry, we always put the word of God in. We always put the scriptures in. Because anybody could tell you anything. And, you know, and they could just be saying all manner of things. But we need to be Berean Christians and check the scriptures and make sure that everything lines up with the book so that we're not deceived because Jesus said in the last day there'll be many deceivers, even false prophets. False prophets aren't in the world. They'll be in the church. Deceivers will be into the church. And we know down the end there, Paul warns about them. After he leaves, others are going to come in and try and do different things in the flock. The only way we're going to know the difference is if we know the word of God. So we need to make sure we are in the word of God, not just listening to others preaching. We need to look and read the words ourselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, God's word. Why do we need to read the book? Because God's word is going to change us. Let's turn to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the word of God. And in his law, in his word, does he meditate day and night. So, you know, question, do we delight ourselves in the word? And, you know, just as we eat natural food every day, we need to eat spiritual food every day. And spiritual food is God's word. And we do that because we need God's word to feed our spiritual man. And this scripture actually says day and night. It says meditate, but it means we've got to be thinking about, and I would even say, you know, studying, looking at the word day and night. I know the children of Israel, they gather the manna every morning. And, you know, we can gather the manna even throughout the day. We're not, we're not scheduled just for the morning. We can gather during the day. Um, I know when I was doing, had my corporate role job, I was uh, at lunchtime, I'd go and get my Bible. I mean, I'd read in the morning, but in that lunchtime, I'd, you know, redeem the time and read it in my lunch break. And then at nighttime, you know, prayer, more prayer. And, and, but giving myself to the word. And, you know, I'm challenged by this day and night. And so, you know, it's going to be worth it. Any sacrifice we make, it's going to be worth it. Hallelujah. And just allowing God to put his word in our heart. All right, Psalm 19. You know, and the more we feed on the word of God, the more we're going to become like him. Hallelujah. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. That's enlightening our spiritual eyes or it's in, and instructing our spiritual eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. That's a reverential fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. You know, the word of God, it can bring, as we read the word of God, it can bring a conviction to our heart that, oh, we need to adjust that area in our life. We need to just, you know, God's word wants to keep us on the straight and narrow. Really, it does. And so as we're reading the word of God, you know, God can be speaking to our heart and we are to measure out, measure up to the word of God. That's the measuring rod. Jesus is the reed. We're measuring up to the word of God and God's doing it in our heart. It's not of a work as a flesh, not of our own, own doing. We just, our part is to give, give opportunity for the word of God to be written in our heart. And it says here that God's word is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. And the word of the Lord is pure, true, 
and right. And God's word is powerful. It changes us, it changes us into God's image. Just like Peter, James, and John, they kept their eye on Jesus and he changed before them. And as we keep our eyes on the word, we too will be changed. And we will no longer be simple or, or unknowing or thoughtless, but we will become more and more wise in him. Hallelujah. And David's also saying here that the, God's word is to be desired more than even money. And most people spend their lives making money, making riches. If only I had this much money, if only I had this, or if only I could do that, or if only, and all the ifs. But, you know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, seek first the kingdom of God, and all the other things will be added. So when we get things in the right priority, we put God first in our life, and everything else just comes together. It just does, because God knows how to look after his children. But the, the well, I'm what, the instruction i was going to say condition the instruction from jesus is seek first the kingdom of god all right hallelujah and so each day we need to make time to be in the word of god not just on our youtube or on the computer with the ministries or whatever actually one-on-one -on -one, me myself with the word of god no other distractions now, it's going to be challenging in some households because there are children and then there are um, spouses and all manner of things and, and people have responsibilities and jobs and ministries and, and work situations. Yes, I understand that. Yet somehow in all of that, God knows all about all of that. But when we put him first, he will actually undertake for us on all those other issues, other situations that may still need to get done that day. But when we honour him first, he undertakes Hallelujah. All right, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 25, 22 to 25. It says, But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we can be hearing the word of God and not doing it. And the Bible says we're actually deceiving ourselves no one else is deceiving us we can be just deceiving ourselves thinking oh we'll be right we'll be right well we won't be right well in the sense that we won't measure up to all that God has God's best for us and so it's in the yielding verse 23 for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass as he beholdeth himself and goes his way he straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was but whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, that's the word, and continues therein, continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. But I'll just read it from the Amplified. It says, but be doers of the word, obey the message. How good is that? That's really clear, isn't it? Obey the message. And you know, Jesus said, was it John 14, 12 or thereabouts? Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the Amplified says, if you love me, obey my word. Hallelujah. So be you doers of the word, obey the message and not merely listeners to it. Betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. That's just like I said, oh, it'll be right. No worries. Oh, I missed prayer. I missed my reading time today. Doesn't matter. You know, what's a meal? Well, I tell you, if you took that same attitude with natural food, Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, oh, I haven't eaten for four days this week. Haven't had a meal this week for four days. Well, your natural body is going to pack in eventually. If you just think you can just go without food, natural food, your body needs natural food to function well. It feeds all our organs and our blood and all, the, all that's necessary required. God made it that way. It's the same spiritually. Our spiritual man needs spiritual food to function, to be strong, to be empowered, to be alive. He needs spiritual food every day to keep him nourished. Amen. All right, verse 3. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being a doer of it, he is like a man who looks carefully at his own nature, face in a mirror. For he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. 
But he who looks carefully into the faultless law, the law of liberty, and is faithful to it and perseveres. So we've got to be faithful and perseveres in looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys. He shall be blessed in his doing, his life of obedience. Okay, his life of obedience. Right, I've got a little mirror here. I've got a little mirror, right? And, um, you know, everyone has a mirror in their homes. And you, know, and you could look at yourself in the mirror and you think, oh, you know, this hair, and I do, this hair is out of place or this little bit needs adjusting or, you know, is it sitting right, sitting right? And then, you know, I might just get wind blown out there. And if I don't go back to the mirror, I'll be walking around with my hair all sticking out here because I won't know because I won't have looked in the mirror. And that can happen to us naturally. You know, we might be okay and then we get into different seasons or different situations and... You know, we think, oh, we're right, but our hair might be all out here. You know, our attitude might be all out here. But when we get back into the word, we'll go, oh, yes, okay. Walk in love, <laughs> forgive, uh, be kind and generous, be peaceable, and so forth. And the mirror, the word of God, allows us and causes us to adjust. Hallelujah. 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 So it's the word of God and God's given us his word. So it will change us. Hallelujah. And the encouraging part to all of this is God chose us knowing exactly what we were like. He knew all about our shortcomings. He knew all about our weaknesses and he still chose us. Praise God that God does the choosing and not us. Probably, you know, none of us would have chosen ourselves think we you know in in ourselves we're not even worthy to be chosen but god does the choosing because he looks in our heart you know man looks on the outward appearance but god looks on the heart and so god saw each heart and he just knew that if he can get the get us born again and fill with the word and fill with the holy spirit he's going to change us he's a good potter he's going to fashion us and he's going to make beautiful vessels and the beautiful vessels are going to be able to contain his full glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. And Jesus is coming again in glory. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. You know that denying himself. There are things that we may want to do or our flesh. But you know we could make that better choice and get the word of God. Or spend time in prayer. You know let him deny himself. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profiteth if he gains the whole world? And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Hallelujah. And I'm going to read it from the Amplified. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself. Disregard lose sight and forget himself and his own interests. I'm not saying this. Jesus is saying this. And take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living and if in need be in dying also. For who's, whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, this comfort and security here, shall lose it. He'll lose his eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake shall find it everlasting life. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what would a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory, majesty, and splendor of his father with his angels. And then he will render account and reward every man in accordance 
with what he has done. You know, it's a, it's a question, Jesus said, for what profits a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, all the riches, all the acclaim, all the, all the assets, and loses his own soul? Nothing is, the only thing that's eternal, the riches, the assets, they're not eternal. Only God's kingdom is eternal. So that's the, that's the challenge, isn't it? That's the question Jesus asked. You know, what is a prophet, what, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hallelujah. We just need to keep things in balance. And that's why this word is coming. So it just reminds us, come on, we're all in this together and we need to just keep pressing into the things of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so whatever sacrifice we make in this life, it can't be compared to what God's got planned for us in eternity. There's just no comparison because this is only temporal. Hallelujah. God's things are eternal. Amen. And let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We are being changed from glory to glory. So 2 Peter chapter 1. And it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained the precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according to as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. God's called us to glory and virtue. That's excellence. Hallelujah. And verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God's given us his word. Hallelujah. And that verse 4 in the Amplified says, By means of these, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceedingly great promises, so that through them, through the word, you may escape by flight from the moral decay, rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed, and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. God doesn't have any problem about blessing his children. We have an issue if there's covetousness, if we are lusting after things. God will give us desires of our heart, but if we are coveting things, that's a whole different pocket in our heart that God needs to adjust. Hallelujah. And he's given us his word. God wants to lavish us. We've just got to just have it all good in our heart. Amen. Amen. And then verse 5, it says, And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith. So we're in faith. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. The Amplified says, For this very reason, adding your diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. And it says, Excellence, resolution, Christian energy. So we're meant to be energized into the things of God. And in exercising virtue, develop knowledge and intelligence. And verse 6, it says, and to knowledge, temperance. So these are the things we are adding into our life. We started off with faith and these attributes we are adding to our life. Temperance and to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And godliness is holiness. You know, patience, don't you just wish you could just snap your finger and have patience? Well, that's clearly impatient, isn't it? If you could just snap your fingers. Patience is acquired. It's a fruit of the spirit, long-suffering. And sometimes we'll, God will allow us to go through different things. And, there's an, and patience is like an endurance, enduring through things, uh, standing in the midst of things and continuing to stand. Amen. The Amplified says, And in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. And in exercising self-control, develop steadfastness, which is patience, endurance. There you are. And in exercising steadfastness, develop godliness which is piety or holiness hallelujah so there's a it's not just a a one-stop thing it's a growing thing it's a developing thing god's character coming forth verse 7 says 
and to godliness or holiness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Amplified says, and in exercising godliness, develop brotherly affection, and in exercising brotherly affection, develop Christian love. That's what charity is. It means love. And verse 8 to 10, it says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. And I'll read it from the Amplified. It says, And for as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, they will keep you from being idle or unfruitful. They will keep you. So we, as we continue to grow in the things of God, they will keep us from being idle and unfruitful unto the full personal knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually short-sighted, seeing only what is near to him and has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Because of this, brethren, we are all the more solicitous and eager to make sure, to ratify, to strengthen, to make steadfast your calling and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble or fall. You know, short-sighted is you can just see things that are short, close to you, right? That's short-sighted, right? But God wants us to have long sight, long vision, to get our vision back on him. Because when we are short-sighted, we are just concerned with our little world and what's happening in, and in just things that are close and near to us. But when we put our eyes on God, that long vision, that vision, long sight, it will keep us focused on what's really important and where we are ordering our steps and what we are doing in our lives. And if we keep that vision before us, we will, it'll help us let go of some of the distractions. It will help us remain our, keep our focus because we know our flesh and the enemy, they're both against us to try and take us off the path, take us away, draw us back, take us back to the ways of where we came from. But we must not fall for it. We, if we keep that vision, what God's plan, what God's purposing, it will just keep us focused. It'll keep us, what's that scripture? It says we have a sure anchor in the word of God. When we anchor our lives in the word of God, no matter what's blowing or what's coming or what's going in the world or in our families or in our church or in whatever situation in our job, if we are anchored in the word, it, we will come through it. We will be all right because our focus is on God and his vision. But if we get sidetracked and we just get short-sighted and we get involved with our own little world, we could miss all that God's got planned. All right, so we don't want to fall for that. We just And so here's a word coming today to make sure, to remind us, to instruct us, to encourage us that God wants us to allow him and us to adjust our lives to his word. Hallelujah. So it's not just beginning with faith. Faith is the foundation, but everything in life in God is about faith. But we are adding to our faith all these other qualities of God's character. And they're being added to us as we're in the word and we go through situations and God is doing it. Hallelujah. I mean, there's a scripture that says Jesus was perfected by the things he suffered. Now, nobody likes suffering, but we know there's a scripture that says, but this suffering works peaceable fruits of righteousness. So there's purpose with everything that happens in our lives. All right. We're changed into God's. We are being changed into God's glorious perfection. All right, and we read of the doctrines of Christ. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6 and 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And it says, Therefore, leaving the principles, that's like the milk, leaving the principles of the doctrines, that's the teachings of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Let us go on unto perfection. So we're not there yet. 
Okay, we're going on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of doctrine of doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of laying out of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. All right, so they're saying we want to go on to perfection if God will permit it. Well, God did not allow the early church to go on to perfection. But a lot of those six principles were working in the early church. And those six principles are being restored to the church. And so the first one was repentance of dead works and faith towards God. Some people split that. But for me, you're repenting, you're repenting from your old ways because you're having faith towards God. Doctrine of baptisms. So there's two baptisms. There's baptism by full immersion in water. Jesus, remember, he came up out of the water. So it's full immersion. And the second baptism was baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's how you know. In the book of Acts, they said how did, they heard them speak in tongues. It's tongues of angels. God puts his Holy Spirit in there and it's the Holy Spirit making intercession for the saints and communicating to God and also makes intercession for others in the body. Number four was the laying on of hands. So that's receiving an impartation. You know, um, Paul said to Timothy, through the laying out of hands, stir up the gifts that was imparted to you. Number five, resurrection of the dead. Now, we know some people do rise from the dead and have over the years. However, this is actually speaking of a spiritual resurrection, a refreshing, a renewal. And it's coming to God's church. Hallelujah. And eternal judgment. Now, eternal judgment was definitely functioning in the early church. For example, Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And they drop dead in church. I have no idea what the, you know, in this time, if these things, as these things are being restored, what the newspapers are going to say. But in the early church, these six doctrines, these six experiences were functioning. However, as I said, the early church were not permitted to go on to perfection. It wasn't for, we're in that last dispensation, but it wasn't for them. It's going to be for us this end of the sixth day hallelujah and meanwhile god's end time church is to experience the full restoration of these doctrines and god has been restoring them and then we go on to perfection to god's full glory all right god's laying the foundation putting it back in place and then we go on to perfection it's really so repentance from dead works and faith towards god that was the first one that was restored in i think it was 1513 by Martin Luther, you know, man, it's not by works that we come to God. It's by faith, repentance and faith. And then in 1642, uh, being water baptized by full immersion was restored to the church. Then in the early 1900s, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was being restored to the church. And then in about 1946, the laying out of hands was being restored and these principles went around the whole world not just a group of people in one pocket these were being restored to god's church and god's church is located throughout the world then in the late 1980s the resurrection of the dead which is a real fresh revival of the holy of coming alive his church god's church coming alive being alive a refreshing a resurrection from spiritual dead this is to the church god wants his church alive not spiritually dead he wants it alive hallelujah and then the next doctrine to be restored is god's to god's church is eternal judgment so that's what's still to come that has not been restored as yet to god's church so no matter what the newspapers are saying or what the uh, some plans might be there, some evil plans that might be uh, considered out there, God's got the plan. And if we just stick with God's plan, it's going to come to pass. And judgment is still to come to God's end time church. There are things happening in God's church that are not pleasing to God. And let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. And we read here, 
for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of the Lord? The Amplified says, for the time has arrived for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begin with us, what will be the end of those who do not respect or believe or obey the good news, the gospel of God? It's only after the sixth doctrine is restored that God's church will be able to go on to perfection. So there's a little bit more work going to happen in God's church first before we measure up to that fullness and then you watch out. When God's church measures up to that fullness, carrying his glory, the greatest harvest is going to come. And yes, there's a harvest, Jesus said. <clears throat> the fields are white to harvest. And so, yes, we should be speaking to people and telling them about the Lord and you know, sharing the gospel with them, how God loves them, he died for them. And seeing people turn to the Lord. I also know what's coming is a great revival <clears throat> throughout the world. And it's going to hit every nation because God's not willing for any to perish. And so we're in this season and it's going to be very exciting. It's going to be exciting in God. And there's another agenda in the world and that's going to be unfolding as well. But it's all in the book. All right. So we don't have any fear or anxiousness. If we keep our eyes on God, it'll be absolutely fine. We will be fine. We'll be safe. We're protected. We're in him. And besides, we're part of his glorious church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. So where do we see the glory of God just in the natural? Let's turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. You know, so where do we see, where do we see, what do we see when we look up into the sky? We see the sun, the moon and the stars. And it says, they declare the glory of God. And what are they? They are all lights. The sun, the moon and the stars. They are all lights. And the sun speaks of the glory of the Father. The moon, which is a reflection of the sun, speaks of Jesus Christ. And the stars, which are everywhere, speak of the Holy Spirit because he's everywhere. He's in the believers all over the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the sun, the moon and the stars, they're in the sky. And they are speaking day and night to the whole world. In Romans, it says, all creation declares the glory of God. And so man is without excuse. When, you know, I know even as a child, we would go camping and bring around the campfire and I'd look up and I'd see all the stars and I'd say to my dad, you know, how did all the stars get there, dad? And I don't know what he said. <laughs> he must have just sort of, I don't know what he said now. But I used to, you know, as a child, I would wonder, how did those stars get there? And so God says, his, his heavens declare him night under night. They're uttering speech. Or well, actually verse 2, it says, day unto day utter speech and night unto night they show knowledge. Hallelujah. God's in the heavens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we also see the glory of God in his word. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 17 and 18. It says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, that's a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. The Amplified says, in verse 18, and all of us as with unveiled face, because we continue to behold the word of God as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured into his very own image 
in an ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All right, so just like we looked in the mirror and we could see ourselves and we, you know, do what we do and we do that probably every day, right? God wants us to look into his mirror, his mirror every day and be changed into his glory. Hallelujah. And be changed into his glory. Hallelujah. Why? And it's going to happen because God's word's alive and powerful. And as we continue to look into God's word, we really are being changed. You might read a passage and you might think, I don't think I got anything out of that or I don't know what that means or whatever, you know. But your spiritual man, he's not your natural man. Your spirit, the natural man receives not the things of God. They are spiritually discerned. Your spiritual man can get a hold of something faster than your natural man. The word of God, we know the parable of sowing the seed. The seed goes into the ground. The ground is the heart. That's where the word of God goes. And then it renews our mind. I know some say it goes into their mind and then renews. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, see, Jesus said, the seed goes into the ground, into the heart, and then our mind is renewed. Hallelujah. And it's saying we are being changed, that verse 18, into that same image from glory to glory. Hallelujah. So as we just keep looking into God's word, we are going to continue to be changed from glory to glory to glory to glory. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to, we see the glory in God's end time church prophesied. Haggai chapter 2. I'll tell you where Haggai is. It's one of those little books in the Old Testament. Haggai is the third book, last book of the Old Testament. Haggai. Right. Haggai chapter 2. Verses 1 to 3, it says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, that's the 21st day, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes as a comparison of it is of nothing? It says of nothing as nothing the seventh month always speaks of tabernacles and tabernacles is the culmination of god's plan verses four to nine yet now be strong o zarubbabel says the lord and be strong o joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest and be strong all ye people of the land saith the lord and work for i am with you says the lord of hosts According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. F fear ye not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens. So this is a prophecy coming through. I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory says the lord of hosts the silver is mine and the gold is mine says the lord of hosts the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former says the lord of hosts and in this place will i give peace says the lord of hosts hallelujah the glory of the latter house is going to be greater you know spiritually silver speaks of pentecostal christians and the gold speaks of those that have measured up to tabernacles, which is God's full spiritual maturity. God's church is going to have gold and silver, people likened to gold and silver. Hallelujah. And we are in the end times. And God has fully prepared his church, his bride. And when she's fully prepared, she is going to shine being full of his light, his glory. She's going to be full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And our last scripture is Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 3. 
and it says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. So here we are. This is prophesying of the church, the bride of Christ. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. You know, gross darkness upon the people. Is that not the time we are now living in? Gross darkness on the people. Darkness covering the earth, right? There's a darkness. It's like a, it's a darkness over the earth. It's a spiritual darkness. However, when things are dark, lights shine brighter. The Amplified says, Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. So no matter what's going on, you know, just get up. Come on. We're in this together. Rise to a new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and dense darkness all peoples. But the Lord shall arise upon you, O Jerusalem. That's speaking of uh, spiritual Jerusalem, his church. And, or, and the bride, of course, and his glory shall be seen on you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Hallelujah. Didn't people come to Jesus, right? Because God's glory was in him and people came from everywhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, you know, light, it does stand out of darkness. So even now, as we shine in a dark world, people will be drawn to the Lord. Hallelujah. And so be encouraged. Everything that God does has purpose. And we have been called for such a time as this. So in summary, what is God's purpose? That we may grow up and be changed from glory to glory into his very image and likeness. Glory to God. And everyone said, Amen.